Maybe for those standing in the back, there are still seats available if you like to here, sit up front. And there on the second row, there's also some seats left. Uh, well, welcome everyone to uh, so, <laughs> um, and to the opening of this exhibition. Um, what I'll do is I'll tell you a little bit about the project um, that has been, well, it's, we started in 2016. So it's now entering its second year, and um, the exhibition um, has been well, traveling a bit uh, within the Netherlands, and it is also now um, exhibited in um, Ljubljana in Slovenia, and tonight we're opening it here. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'll walk you through yeah, what this project is about, so how you, how to frame, uh, yeah, or when you will see the different uh, artworks and, and ideas and proposals you'll see in, uh, on, around in this space um, to better understand like, how how this all came about. Um, but maybe as a starter, and just to see where we are, where you are basically, and uh, in terms of uh, knowledge, like who knows what the um, deep web is, and or has an idea what the deep web is, and who knows has some some idea of what the dark web is and the difference between them. Like, uh, who has ever been navigating the deep web? Only one person? No, you're all lying. And who has entered the dark web at some point? Only two. Well, some of you are going to find out that you actually have explored the deep web um, on a daily basis without knowing it. Um, so if you think of the World Wide Web, if you think of the internet, uh, it is often understood in terms of uh, naval uh, metaphors or aquatic uh, metaphors and navigational metaphors. So you, uh, you surf the web, um, a search engine navigate you uh, through, through the network. Um, and if, for example, the Safari icon this looks like uh, a compass. So there's these, these sort of ways of how to go through a space uh, that is related to well, the, the aquatic world. Um, the same holds true for the, well, for the deep web and the dark web and the surface web. And then it's, it's understood more in terms of um, iceberg, where, um, see? So the top of the iceberg, so the actual iceberg, that's the surface web, and it is. You could see it as that's the part of the web that you that's indexed uh, with by um, popular search engines. So, for example, uh, Google or or Bing or Yahoo. So this is the web that you can yeah, that we all use on, on a daily basis. Um, but then there's a big part of the web under the surface of the water um, that is not indexed by these popular search engines, which means that it's. Um, that you cannot access it through your regular Google search engine or your Yahoo or other types of um, the more popular um, um, uh, search engine, engine. So it's it's data that's n that is not indexed. And the, and although only three of or four hands went up, um, it is a part of the web that you actually use quite often. For example, when you um, do any online payments or when you are on Netflix. Uh, when you use webmail, uh, when you uh, read uh, an online uh, an online uh, journal or newspaper or magazine that you are subscribed to, so you have to log in, or so all these all these kinds of activities that are quite daily, then you use the deep web. So you might access an online subscription or Netflix through the surface web, but to get past uh, the surface, to 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 get to your account, to your bank account. Um, you, you, you'll, end, you're, you'll be entering the deep web, um, and the dark web is part of the uh, part of the deep web. You could say like it's a tiny part of it, um, and that's like the two of them often get conflated because dark web, uh, well, you, like in the most in the simplest ways, is also uh, that part of the web that's not indexed by the popular search engines. But also, uh, you, you need to. Uh, yeah, it requires specific software to be able to access it. So it consists of uh, yeah, what they call dark networks, and they can be very small uh, P2P networks. So 
peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, um, but they could also be fairly large networks such as Tor, for example, um, and then it has a different domain. So where you're probably used to .com or .org or .whatever country we're in, um, the, for example, the, uh, the domain that's used by or, or claimed by Tor is .onion. So these are probably sites that you don't see uh, that often. Um, and there's, of course, there, there are other domains, but then they're not the .com or the .org domains. Um, so the, what is, what's different about them is that, um, I mean, the dark web being part of the deep web, being still part of the same iceberg, um, is that your identity location cannot be traced, which is why it is popular among well, um, journalists, activists, um, and any, any person, uh, like the, you, you can send email uh, encrypted, any person who who's has serious concerns about data tracking and, and the use and analysis of data can, uh, well, it, it, these, kinds of, um, it's these kinds of people that will use the services provided by uh, dark uh, web uh, networks or, um, or services. And it's also the same reason, because your, your location and identity cannot be traced, it's also the reason why it, um, it is a perfect uh, part of the, in, uh, the internet to do or to, to sell and uh, service uh, illegal services or, or to uh, buy and sell illegal uh, goods. Um, but then we thought, okay, so a lot of the people conflate deep and, and dark, uh, not knowing that you're actually using uh, probably at least the deep web um, on a daily basis. And then, but if this is as far as experts concerned, the the only place where you can serve or you can go online without having your information tracked and analyzed, and has such a bad name, that's not doing us a, a good service. I mean, you could, you could think of it a little bit as the early days of the internet, where a lot of people thought, yeah, well, it's just, you know, a place where you can order pizza and watch porn, right? And maybe gamble. But I mean, yes, that was there. Those were, that was part of the early days of the internet, but I mean, nobody will refer to the internet as that place of gore where you can only buy pizza and watch porn. I mean, it, it has developed. And so the idea of the, the second crypto design challenge was like, well, could we come up with different imaginaries so we can maybe speed up the process where the deep in the dark is not just about online banking or webmail or, or gore or whatever, cannot see the light of day, but maybe um, if we engage with it differently, um, more people will make use of it, it will develop into something that is a bit more hospitable, uh, not just to people who want to buy drugs and, and guns, but also to all kinds of uh, other services. I mean, it already is, like it's not, it's for a reason that a lot of activists and journalists um, uh, make use of it, but um, to familiarize ourselves with those parts of the web that we often, well, many of us think we don't use, or that we don't use, but that we could use, um, and as a sort of a free zone, or that, that free zone of the internet that, that hasn't been monetized, politicized, and datafied yet. So that was the idea of, um, of this challenge that we organized. And um, let's see, yeah, so the question we asked designers was to, how to visually grasp a uh, space or a network that um, facilitates such a variety of information and activities, right? So uh, from liking uh, something on, on Facebook or watching a cat video to uh, order a murder for a murder for hire, or I mean, this is, and we're still talking about the same World Wide Web. Um, but, but the variety of activities that you can do on this web are so different. Um, and only the top service, only the service web is what we actually engage with, but there's so much more. So how how could we familiarize ourselves with with this with this well, below water web? And then we asked um, yeah, artists and designers and geeks and everyone who had a an, any any visionary uh, to well, come up with, um, for example, tour browser um, art projects or to design online free zones and how they would how would they look what would they look like or come up with um, visualizations of all kinds, or maybe design interventions or interfaces that make it um, more easy to navigate. Um, because we, we thought, like, well, maybe we need new icons, right? Maybe the deep and the dark doesn't really work. 
Maybe same with email, you have this little envelope I icon, or with a trash can, you, 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 you drag something to the corner of your screen, and people think that they've trashed something, although they haven't, so just replaced it or um, put it somewhere else. Uh, the same with sending an, uh, an email, like the envelope makes little sense. And if, you, if you, it represents, it helps us frame and think about, it helps us understand what we're doing uh, by, yeah, by, by you know, making the unfamiliar familiar uh, by way of relating it to something that we know, like sending a letter. And if you compose an email, it's also composed like a letter. So the, the address goes on top, and then the subject, and then, and then the text. And although what's happening at the back end is very different from sending a letter, it, it does help us to like, OK, so I'm actually electronically sending a mail. So we thought, well, maybe we could ask the more creative amongst us to help us come up with, with maybe different icons or different ways of, of um, relating to those parts of the web that are, um, that are considered uh, still to be open, not corporatized, not politicized, and not um, um, surveilled. So, um, so we asked for also for different kinds of maps, perhaps like maybe we need to let go of this iceberg uh, metaphor. It helps maybe a little bit, but it also uh, keeps the dark and deep uh, underwater, like as if it's like fishy and cold and yeah, not very accessible. Uh, so maybe we could come up with better met metaphors that make it more accessible, um, and or perhaps different maps. And so, for example, if you think of the um, maybe if you flip it, if you would look at the same metaphor and, and just turn it around, it already makes a huge difference, right? So, what is what what's what's considered sort of murky, deep, dark waters is now at the top and and has a far more central position than what than if you than in the previous image. It looks it makes you look in a different way to uh, what you've just seen before. It's the same image, it's just uh, flipped. Same goes for if you, you know, flip it sideways, um, it it cuts the, the web or it cuts the web, web, web up in, in different it seems different image, but it's not. But it, it's these kinds of little changes that do matter in terms of how we understand things. So we thought, that then maybe let's toss the iceberg and let's see what happens if we give, um, if you just ask designers to come up with anything they think is important for us to know and to engage with. And um, well, that resulted in an interesting um, exhibition where you uh, are now, um, or that you will see in, in a few. Um, so what you could see is like, well, it, it, it's, diff it's difficult, of course, to engage with something as abstract as the dark and the deep, and, um, and how, do you, how do you make sense of that? And one of the things that, that we saw in, in, in all the different um, works that were sent to us is like that um, artists would often, often hark back to old and familiar media to understand, uh, to make sense of, 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 of the deep web. So for example, games were often referenced, or visualizations, or graphs, graphs or um, like familiar images um, that were then used or reused in, in a way to help explain what this dark and deep was all about. Um, so you'll see, for example, uh, yeah, a few works that I selected that you'll see in this space, just to get a sense of you know, the different ways of, of, of relating to this um, dark and deep web. Um, so uh, your deep web stories, which is here on the, on the wall, um, contains basically, um, it's, a, it's a simple idea, so they ask people um, what their experience with the deep web is, and the result is uh, short for quotes from people that have you know, shared their experience with the deep web or on the deep web, and it varies from the, the, the super doll to the fictional to the weird to the everyday to the sensational. And that's basically a way of like, well, these are all different kinds of stories or bits and pieces from, from experience on, on, on the deep web. And uh, reading them, you, can, you think like, yeah, I mean, what, so, what, makes, the, what make, makes it so specifically deep about, about uh, what, yeah, what, what is deep about, about these stories? And, not so much, but it's more like, okay, well, uh, let's get rid of the tropes of like the, the pornography and the child pornography and the, and the illicit trade, and let's just 
if you if you ask people about their experiences, they're 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 nothing special really. So it's sort of a way to make it a bit you know, a way to make it a bit more or less sensational and more mundane. Um, so you can see afterwards you can read some of the some of the quotes here on the wall. Um, and then there is masquerades, which is um, it's used as a, yeah, a different strategy. It's basically a tool that sends out noise in the form of, uh, you could say, false positives. So it's, it's a tool that sends out messages that, that contain um, alleged uh, trigger words. So words that might be flagged or intercepted or uh, messages that draw attention. So in a way, it, it's sort of a decoy. That's the idea, or creating a lot of disruption and noise on the network. Uh, so that uh, to confuse, um, yeah, to confuse sort of the recognition systems and uh, the data snooping um, um, technologies that are monitoring and collecting and, and using data. And you can find that one in the corner. Um, and then the Bank of Humanity, which is um, a bank of online humanity, which is uh, a speculative bank. And I think I'm not sure you know, what the discourse here is like exactly, but I'd like to hear that in the afterwards. Um, but for example, in Netherlands, you often hear calls uh, to maybe we should own our own data, maybe we should, um, we should be the ones that should uh, be able to exploit or sell or use or have, it, have our data uh, give it to companies or not, that, that we should be the ones uh, to decide this, a sort of ownership idea. Um, and the Bank of, hum uh, of Online Humanity, uh, who ac actually won the Audience Awards, um, yeah, took this a step further and thought, like, okay, well, what would a, a bank of, uh, what if you could open a, a data account at a bank, and then you could, you are the owner of your own data, and like, a bit like uh, how a bank works, but then you are, uh, you you are in charge of your own data, and this was, uh, well, as it won the Audience Award, it was clearly a, a popular. Uh, idea uh, within in, in the audience, um, and lastly, deeply, which won the jury prize. Uh, you'll see that over there in the corner. Um, yeah, deeply, basically, it's a sort of um, it's a condom, um, but then uh, it's sort of a playful, tongue-in-cheek way to make, um, yeah, to make. Yeah, it provides you with um, secure uh, with a secure uh, digital card um, by, by Tails. So you can this is a card that you can insert into your computer to explore and service uh, well the service web and the deep web without leaving any uh, any trails. But the the design aims to make deep web and dark web maybe a bit more sexy, uh, and also it, it, it you associate it with uh, protection. So you you protect yourself so you can. Uh, for safe exploring, basically. So that's the idea of like how maybe uh, uh, an object that we all know, um, that we, we all understand what it refers to, it's, it's, it's the campaign of safe sex, and, uh, and to use this as a way of like, well, maybe we should uh, associate deep web or dark web with, with, with protection, or with protected sex, or with protected contact. Uh, be that on the internet, on, in the internet or amongst uh, your peers, uh, and this one a jury award. Um, and then I thought maybe um, because to take it a little, take it a little bit further, this idea of shielding yourself of online protection, of of finding uh, ways to uh, create a barrier between you and well the the technology you're interacting with. Um, this idea of shielding and uh, protecting has also been explored by artists who are concerned about data collection, not only online, but also offline. Like when we walk the streets, um, there's a, you, could, you could see many CCTV cameras, and which are, are, may or may not be equipped with uh, facial recognition technology or other kinds of recognition uh, technology. And so there's, there's numerous artists that over the past few years have been engaging other types, of, other types of recognition that could be linked to or or, or networked uh, and collected. Uh, so that, you know, it's not only your online data that that is, that is being tracked and analyzed, but also 
um, when you look about it's, uh, in street view, uh, you could be um, the means are there for you uh, for you to be followed or to be traced or, or to be recognized if, if necessary. Um, and they come up with different ways to well, sort of to evade uh, recognition technology, uh, and they use cryptographic uh, strategy. So they use cryptographic layers in their designs of um, mask and stealthware um, to confuse recognition. So, um, as you might know, like identity recognition, but also it enables the recognition of well, people and things, um, but also but it can also link all kinds of uh, objects, people and things. Uh, in, so the idea was that um, a growing group of artists have been developing not just I mean, the things that you see here, but also uh, textiles, um, masks, um, but also umbrellas, um, makeup, and different kinds of daily objects um, in order to yeah, make the idea of, of, of cryptography a bit more mundane and a bit more well, quotidian. Um, so I want to discuss, just walk through a couple of these projects uh, and maybe to look at, okay, so how is recognition then perceived and how is it contested or how is it uh, resisted by these artists? And it's done so in different ways. So for example, here, um, Zach Blas on your left, um, his project face case is basically a visualization of how recogni facial recognition technology works. So it's, it, it shows you the anchor points of which, on which uh, that are um, yeah, the anchor points of facial recognition technology, and they work. It works through uh, like the the, the, the um, distances between eyes and nose, and, uh, and uh, nose and mouth. And that's where it, it finds, that's where it captures, that's what, where it's focused on. So, and he, and he visualized, like, well, what, would it, what does it look like if, we, if I actually would make, materialize those anchor points? And um, that's what the face cage um, is for. So, it, it also contrasts this, these sort of um, well, soft and human shapes with this sort of ge geometric, uh, like a, this is what a um, datafied face looked like. It's just lines and dots and patterns and the recognition of lines and dots and patterns, recognition of dark and light. Uh, Adam Harvey developed stealthware, and this is uh, layered, so this is where that is um, also layered with um, cryptographic materials so that um, this is specifically for drones, so you cannot be recognized by, by a drone. Like you're, you, it will not recognize your shape as uh, that being a shape of a human moving about. Um, Privacy Goals is a project by a, a team of Japanese researchers, and they created, um, yeah, basically goggles that are equipped with um, infrared light sources, and as you can see, um, and those light sources confuse this, uh, the, the, the software, the recognition software, without impairing your fi your vision. So, if you look at uh, uh, think back of the face the face cage, it, it basically overexposes the anchor points where that facial recognition needs to, to be able to recognize your face. Um, exactly those um, yeah, parts of your face are overexposed so that it cannot, um, yeah, it cannot capture uh, a face. And although I mean, they may look very clunky, the idea is like how can we experiment with ways of uh, like wearing glasses or, or wearing something that is familiar to us, and at the same time, um, it helps us to stay private or um, to not be recognized. And um, then there's Leo Salvatra's uh, You Are Me surveillance. It's, it's a prosthetic that contains, um, yeah, it consists of a wearable prosthetic of his, of his face. So the idea is that um, this mask is a 3D rendition of his face but also used identity, re um, identity replacement technology. So it has his um, facial features, such as uh, skin tone and texture and, and, and facial hair. And the, um, if, you wear, if you would wear the, this mask, um, and you would sit in front of a computer it, or, or any, any kind of machine that has recognition, facial recognition, uh, equipped with facial recognition, then it would, um, it, it tags his face, so it, it thinks 
you are him. So which is why it's called you are me. The idea is like, well, um, I, that it, that his mask is like that he offers you his face instead of your own. So you basically, you can move about in, in, in the city and, and do whatever you like and um, his face will be recognized or his face will be uh, linked to uh, to whatever you to your activity, so it's 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 a form of a decoy. Um, Taylor trust, uh, yes, it's a similar thing as, as the stealth, where it, it's a veil that you can wear. Um, that um, yeah, so again, that it, it thwarts off any form of recognition because it's the material is as such that any monitoring or censoring system cannot focus on it or cannot um, capture. And then we have Martin Bucket with his uh, pixel hat mask. He calls it a, he calls it a mask himself, although it may look a little bit more like a balaclava. Um, but the idea of this mask is uh, to provide an anonymity. So what he says, uh, what he's afraid of is that well, um, anonymity is what well, is it, yeah, it, it, it has lost its meaning, um, and this way he hopes to. Yeah, sort of, um, yeah, safe, uh, like to offer anonymity online. That's basically, uh, that's what he says. Like, well, um, I'm worried that uh, in an interview he says, I'm worried that anonymity will lose its meaning, and um, especially in, in the internet era, and especially uh, because of all these recognition technologies that, for example, uh, uh, computers are also um, equipped with. So this is, he offers this sort of pixelated, uh, yeah, pixelated face um, that you could wear online and offline. Um, and, and then another um, project which is called CC Dimi Not, the, it's an umbrella. It's basically the same idea as the, as the goggles, so it's an umbrella with light sources, infrared light sources, and overexposes uh, recognition te technology. It's the same idea, like a, a very basic um, yeah, a tool that you could you know, that you could walk the streets, uh, or you could you, you could bring this to work or to wherever you go, and nobody will think it is weird unless maybe the sun is shining, but it's just an umbrella. Um, and then the anti-surveillance uh, feminist boy hair and makeup party, uh, which is uh, I'll come back to this uh, later. But the idea of they uh, applied um, the makeup design uh, of an art of, of Adam Hartley's CV Dazzle, to which I'll, I'll come back in a minute. And the idea of this is that like, basically you could do wear any makeup or any wig uh, as long as it um, uh, highlights different features of your face and, and, and darkens what is usually highlighted in your face, then uh, it's sort of an analog way to, um, yeah, to play around with uh, pattern rec recognition. So uh, pattern recognition you know, works through recognizing patterns. And these patterns are, for example, that, that your cheekbones are usually light and your eyes are usually in uh, dark um, and your mouth is usually dark. So in, instead of, if you toy with that, then, you, you, then this uh, recognition mechanism that is trained to uh, recognize uh, faces on, on the basis of dark and light patterns if you toy with these patterns, then you can confuse uh, the recognition systems, and um, and they uh, well they they went uh, they are very creative with their ways of, of doing this, and this is one example of um, yeah you know, for how you could wear your hair and makeup for as to not be recognized. So these were these are three um, mass projects that I want to get into with a bit more detail. Uh, also because I think they're, they're quite exemplary in the way of how uh, recognition technology and, and data recognition uh, and data collection is um, imagined and how, yeah, what are the different ways to go about this, this imagining and how the different ways of, uh, of contesting it. Um, so in a way they, they're all, it's, it's three, sort of one yeah, camouflage uh, project and two mask projects, but each of them is a response to, to data collection and to the monetization and, uh, of our data and how it's used by corporations and, and state uh, organizations uh, without, without our consent or even, in, even if we agree to the terms um, of service, um, then there's, there's hardly any alternative. So there's, it 
doesn't really give us a fair, it doesn't give us a fair alternative. So in that sense, um, like how, yeah, what is the way forward? We're stuck on this, on this iceberg. Everyone's using uh, the same uh, search engines. Uh, there's a recognition um, uh, technology everywhere where we go. How, what, are, what, what can we do? Where is our, you know, what types of agency are still possible in such an environment? And that's where these, these masks step in. So basically you could see these, these masks as um, uh, of coming to grips with a changed environment. Like our environment has changed, online and offline have become a little blurry. Um, so how do, we, how, do we come, how do we come to grips with, with this changed environment? Like how do we relate to, to an environment which is, has been so, which is surveilled, uh, which is datafied and monetized, and how can we um, relate to it and engage with it in a way that's either playful or, uh, or, or political or in a different ways of, of, of engaging with, with this changed environment? So for example, um, the Crispin's uh, data masks, um, he's an artist and technologist, and they've been uh, produced by a reverse, reverse engineering. So his masks um, attempt to visualize what kind of models are used to train uh, facial recognition systems. So what, what, what passes uh, for a face online? Like, so what is, if you have a spectrum of, of faces that, that, that a facial recognition algorithm will recognize, these, the shapes that you see in his projects are, um, are part of that spectrum. So this is, like, if you, faces that are, uh, or pictures or images that are this blurry will still be recognized as, as a face. The, the algorithm can still work with, um, with even images as blurry as this one. And uh, Crispin believes that we are always being seen and watched and analyzed by what he calls a technological other that peers into our bodies and that we are witnessing the rise of what he calls a networked organism that sees human beings as abstract things and not as people whose lives uh, matter. Um, and then Harvey, in the middle, he uses a very different strategy, basically a no-tech, or even low-tech, but no-tech um, uh, strategy. So CV Dazzle is a kind of um, camouflage makeup. Do, does any of you know what dazzling is, or have you heard of dazzling as a technique? Because you could, um, the idea of dazzling is um, it was used um, as a technique on, on warships during uh, the First World War. So, and uh, often Cubist artists would, would um, paint warships, uh, with, like they would paint them in very colored stripes and, and bold colors. And this technique uh, would disrupt the outline of a ship. So, when at sea, um, and a ship painted in these bright and, and bold colors and, and dark and white and, uh, and dark and, and light um, uh, patterns, uh, they would make it very difficult for an enemy ship to, to, de to detect a, sh a ship size and range, uh, motion and, and speed. So you, you see something happening, but you see, like, you see a shape, but you can't, you don't know what it is. It's like as if you, it looks a little bit like as if it's pixelated or as if it's like a blurry, uh, yeah, blurry shape on the horizon. So this is a very popular technique in, in the First World War, and, and he basically takes that idea of um, of uh, toying with uh, yeah, like the, the, the shapes and contours of a ship by way of light and dark uh, patterns, and he copies that to, to make up. So his idea of the C of CV Dazzle is, uh, like we've seen before, it makes, it darkens what is usually light, and it lights up what, what's usually dark. So it, it you could say it, um, it disforms or misforms the face, uh, so so that it doesn't look like an average face, so that it won't be recognized by recognition systems. And um, he says, like he explains that what motivated this work is that he feels that somebody is watching him in his day-to-day -day activities. That you always have a chaperone and someone um, who looks over your shoulder. Now, a very different technique is used by. Uh, blast a special weaponization suit. So these are masks that are, were produced during uh, workshops that were specifically geared at um, LGBT and uh, minority groups. Um, so he aggregated the, the facial data of participants in his workshop and particularly he distinguished between, for, for example, uh, 
black practitioners or, or gay uh, practitioners, and he color-coded each minority group, so to say, I sat and like, collected their facial data, scrambled it, and turned it into, yeah, and sort of an amorphous, blobby um, mask that you see on the that you see on the right. Um, so he argues that um, recognition technologies um, yeah, control us uh, by making by making us visible, by making us by giving us the feeling that we're constantly being seen. Uh, and against this visibility, his mask re represents like a resistance to what he calls informatic visibility. Like all these technologies make us informatically visible. Um, yeah, the, how, how to contest that? Um, this is the way that he thinks. Well, this is the way how he envisions um, uh, what resistance could look like. Like uh, instead of being, uh, uh, yeah, being sort of a, what he calls a faceless threat. So. Um, you, you, and yeah, it, it, it just, it's layers of cryptographic materials that disrupt recognition. It also shows you uh, what you have, to, what you have to do to be able uh, to be unrecognizable. You know, that what you have to look like, uh, either through makeup or through masking, in order not to be recognized. So, if you consider these very different works, uh, they have a very different. Yeah, approach in, the, in their design. So one shows um, how recognition algorithms work, so how the machine sees. Basically, that's what, uh, what Crispin's data mask do. So this is what the machine sees. It, like this is what uh, this is a face according to uh, the the, mach the machines that, that see us as he imagines them to do. Uh, and then another is, is a low tech or no tech way to toy, basically to throw a little bit of sense in the machine uh, to toy with these algorithms. And the third is focused on confusing facial recognition while simultaneously pointing to minority groups and the different vulnerabilities of minority groups. Like we all know we're not surveilled in the same way, um, uh, being uh, white and Western, uh, you know, that I already do not click certain boxes and certain faces are criminalized and, uh, politicized and, and policed even before they are recognized by any kind of technology. So this is what, what he's, and he's pointing at, like, well, we're not all surveilled in the same way, and we have to account for differences in terms of sexuality, uh, skin color. Um, yeah, there's, there's different ways. We, we need to, this debate needs a bit more nuance. It's not, we're, all not, we're not all surveilled in the same way. So if, if together, if, if, we, uh, if we look at the different um, well, crypto designs that, you, that you'll see here on the wall, if you look at these, and if you look at these uh, masks, you could see they are um, their response to what is perceived as a loss of control over our data. And like, well, you know, when we go online, we do all sorts of things, but at the back end, uh, our data is collected. We don't know by whom. We don't know how it will be used or when. Uh, we don't know if it will backfire. Um, we don't know. There's a lot of things that sort of that are black box at the back end, and this is clearly a response to that loss of control over your data. Um, it's also a response to, uh, because all, most of these works have been uh, created somewhere around, well, within the last eight, nine years. So it, it, you could also clearly see it as a response to all the leaks, um, this Northern leaks, and in 2003 already, other leaks that informed us about you know, how, how the surveillance systems work and, and, uh, and, and who are the third parties. We know a little bit. We don't know exactly how and when and, and how much, but we do know that there's a lot of there's a lot happening at the backside of you know, of our online activities. And at the same time, you could see well all these uh, the responses to our call and, and these masks. They also express a desire for individual ownership. Um, this is something that, for example, uh, Harvey um, uh, expresses multiple times in interviews. Like, well. It, he thinks it's important that we have ownership of our own data, and he sees uh, his ways of, of toying with recognition sy systems also as a way of reclaiming that data, or re at least reclaiming the, the control over it. That's the idea of it. Well, to provide, um, yeah, to, to, to get back some privacy by way of, um, yeah, using these kinds of strategies. Um, it's also a desire to just throw sense in the machine, or just to, to yeah, fight back, resist in a playful way, an artistic way, um, to rebalance uh, yeah, the, the, 
the, the power between well, the state and the corporations and the third parties that are doing all the snooping and, our and us as individual users. Like, how could we, we, we rebalance this? Or well, maybe, you know, if they're so eager to get our data, let's do whatever what we can do for them not to get hold of our data. And it's a move away, or at least a desire to move away from all these um, yeah, central mediators, so like the, the, all the major platforms uh, that are happy to collect whatever they can from us and then uh, and then happy to sell it. Um, so how different ways of, within that space, within that corporatized uh, monitor space, like how could we, how could we reclaim a little bit of space, or how could we uh, assert our some some kind of agency in relation to these uh, to these big, um, yeah, platforms. Um, so these masks also show us how recognition and collection uh, technology is is perceived, right? Like it's it's perceived as if, as if you're being seen, as if you're being followed, as if you're uh, as if you as if something is taken away from you, extracted from you, and these masks uh, and these projects and, and the tools and games that you will see here, um, yeah, they provide uh, the idea that that, they, that you need to be shielded from these technologies. That they, they they give you they provide you with a shield between you and uh, and yeah the your environment basically it be that online or offline, but basically in an environment where where it is felt that you're being watched or, or, or seen or, or analyzed uh, or that you're being reduced to data. So you could see that uh, the worries of these critics are mainly focused on the effects it has on, on the individuals. That they're, it's a very individualistic approach and a very humanistic approach. Um, and that's, I mean, that's also what you get when, uh, as I said before, like metaphors matter, they frame. Um, but if you see uh, recognition technology as an it that sees, then uh, any any way to uh, contest it or to criticize it is to not to be seen by the it that sees, so to hide from it or to conceal conceal your face from it. Um, so what you often see with these cryptographic strategies that you will also see in the room around here is that they're often expressed in terms of, of binaries. So uh, you go from the from the traceable to the untraceable, um, recognizable to the unrecognizable, unidentifiable, unrecognizable. So th there's a, there's a quite a strong binary logic here. It's a bit the same with uh, the surface web and the deep web, as the, as the deep and dark are often conflated. Like the one is like the surface web, and then, then the opposite, like where all the dirty stuff happens, and you know, that's deep web. Where you could also say like, well, maybe the dirty stuff is happening on the service web with all the collecting without our consent and, um, and all the not knowing where our data is going, maybe that's the, the dirtier part of it. Um, not to be a contrarian at all, but um, just to see that how, yeah, how, how, how this is often expressed in, in binaries. And um, if you understand cryptography in binary terms, it's, it's quite a yeah, limiting approach because there's only, two, there's only one thing that you can do with a binary is, is to turn it around. So you have to go from, from identity to non-identity, from face to anti-face, from uh, being visible to being uh, invisible. Whereas you could see, um, well, especially in the work of, of Zach Blass, but also in the project that you see around here, there are different ways uh, to, go, to go about this. Like cryptography could also be seen as, um, as a play between um, the self, uh, the environment and the means of capture. Like it's it's a it's at least has three pillars. It's not just man human versus machine, but it's 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 the human, it's its environment, and it's all the technologies um, that it that it that it engages with or is um, entangled with and embedded in. And um, so it's it, it is more um, it is more subtle than just a simple opposition. And I think the Sackblas shows you know, a, a bit more nuanced and a bit more complex way of, of how to deal with these technologies as he, since he, yeah, since he um, is focusing on the minority groups and on how the different vulnerabilities of minority groups, he draws a line between, or he draws lines from uh, hardware to software um, to uh, yeah, the vulnerability of different minorities. And in many interviews, um, he states that he that by the use of by the design of these masks, 
he stands with uh, collective protest movements like the Zapatistas and um, and Pussy Riot. So again, there he draws lines between software and, and, and the political. It's not just a human first machine we're up against. There's a whole political system and a whole economic system that makes these um, technologies possible. Um, so it's it's. The, the, the fight is well, the fight the, 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 to contest it just by, by by being technologically specific or just focusing on the technological specifics. You obfuscate um, yeah the whole ecology that is investing in and um, uh, yeah that that is investing and also entangled in these uh, and in these practices. Um, so you could say, well, these masks, uh, his mask is, uh, and, and the other mask, and, and the, the design, designs here are a way of, um, yeah, of, of getting, getting a grip on a changed environment, and that is done by basically, you could say, it's a play to explore the limits of vision. So in, in very different ways, uh, the limits of vision are explored. Like, what does, where does a recognition stop? Um, where does it begin? How can we play with this? How can we play with being? Uh, we're still using, the, like, let's say, the roads, uh, but not being recognized as moving on them. Like, how can we play with, with, with our, yeah, our visibilities and our invisibilities? How can we play with environment, self, self um, individual, and, and its me and the means of capture? So the technologies, how could we um, explore them and, and, and push them to, do, uh, to different ends? Um, so. It's, it's about the blurring of boundaries between yourself and your environment and, and whatever technologies that you are that are part of this environment and part of this part of this self. So I don't know if you like in, in Dutch we have an expression um, like to, to show your true face or, or to mask your feelings, which um, um, assumes that there's this layer of reality or like there's, there's this me, there's this, this real me. Um, with in a, in a true face and a mask I, I put on, and that's it's a bit also a very limited conception of what is what a self and a mask is, because um, you could uh, you could say that for, for example um, Margaret Steinberg uh, Steinberg argues and a German philosopher like uh, mask and, and face play a game constantly. There's not just a mask and a face. There's uh, there's in, like the the game that mask and fa face play is infinitely subtler than just this is the true you and that is the not true you. This is the self and this is the non-self. So this uh, this idea of masking also stems in the longer tradition of um, of resistance to to self identity and especially the anonymous masks uh, stand in a tradition that was um, a critique on the, this notion of the self and and uh, an attempt to liberate yourself from the notion of the self, that there's only one self. Um, so whereas, for example, uh, Crispin and, and Harvey have a more, well, more dualist conception of masking and self, like you need a mask to protect the self, um, there's, a, there's a lot richer tradition there of, 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 of masking and self and, and the play between them. Um, so it's, it's this, yeah, the notion of, um, this, again, the surface play, same with camouflage, the surface play between self and mask, and how, um, how they stand in, 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 sort of in relation to each other, and, um, yeah, and, uh, the bound and the blurring boundaries between them. So, um, to end this exhibition and, and, and these masking projects, uh, you could say that they're opening new ways um, to think about the relations between you, uh, your, your multiple selves and your multiple masks and, and the thin line between them and the technology and the environment that we're all uh, entangled with and embedded in. So these are, you could say, like creative inventions of new figurations, new figurations of a changed environment, uh, an environment that is for one, for a part, very mm, well, uh, monopolized and uh, corporatized and um, datafied and fighting a little bit fighting back through new, through new uh, figurations, uh, new ways of engaging and, and resisting. And they might look clunky or they might look uh, untenable, but that's not the point. The point is that they show us new ways of relating to, to an environment that is technological, that is corporatized, that is political, um, 
that is, uh, it's all these things together. It's not just about software, it's also about politics and how do we relate to that? And so I think if, when you go about um, these different works to think, of, to think of it in that way, like, hey, how, what kind of way of relating does this uh, promote? And uh, how, is, how does it uh, conceptualize the self in relation to our changed environment? And um, yeah, is, it, is this about me or is this about someone else? Um, yeah, do I feel at home in this new environment that they're, um, that they're creating? So um, it, the, and the more important point is that these new configurations can help us we'll get away, uh, we'll, get, we'll get rid of this um, iceberg that we're now stuck on, and it could open like, new, yeah, new ways of relating, basically, and new ways of configurating uh, what is considered a, a changed space. So I hope with that um, you have a bit of an idea or or, or, or how to you know, how to see these works because that's the weird thing about um, something as abstract as the internet. Like when you ask designers and, and critics to come up with new configurations and new images, and then you're stuck with paper um, printed on a wall. But to um, uh, yeah, to, to this might help you to yeah. To, to look at these um, uh, to look at these projects as you know, speculative and ways of, of opening up new new environments and new horizons. Thank you.